Hello, I'm Donald McIntyre of Nation.com. This is Nation Live, and joining us is Stefan Thomas, Chief Technology Officer of Ripple Labs. Hello, Stefan. How are you? Hey, I'm doing well. How are you? Very well, thank you. Stefan, I wanted to ask you about uh, Codius, the project in general, and how it works. Uh, because the other day I, I spoke to David Schwartz, uh, Ripple Labs uh, Chief Cryptographer. We spoke about Ripple, and we spoke about the limitations in terms of smart contracts. Mm -hmm. And I know that Codius is a project that you're leading um, to solve that problem, not only for Ripple, for, but for other networks. Mm -hmm. So so could you tell me like an overview, what is Codius? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So um, when I first joined Ripple Labs, um, I was tasked with kind of defining the smart contracts platform for Ripple. Right. And it was kind of something that um, I think every, like, every, all of the different cryptocurrency networks were to some extent or other thinking about like, what their answer is for that question of smart contracts. Bitcoin has its scripting language, and there's Ethereum, and there's all these other like, you know, master coins and so on. They all have some answer for um, you know, how do you make that money programmable, how do you make assets programmable, um, et cetera. So I was kind of like tasked with trying to figure out what how, do, how should it work on Ripple, what should Ripple do. Um, and just for context, like this was pretty early. This was um, uh, back in 2013, like early 2013. Um, and so there was, other than Bitcoin scripting, there wasn't a whole lot out there yet um, to, a lot of, to draw a lot of inspiration from. Um, but one of the experiences that I took away from, from you know, working very closely with some, some of the core Bitcoiners and um, kind of working with Bitcoin scripts was that it was really important that development would be easy, right? And mm -hmm. so um, we kind of thought about, okay, how can we make it more like you would normally write programs? So that's kind of the, the general theme that we started with. Um, and that kind of goes through the entire history of Codius. What, so what, what is... Sorry, sorry. Go was it going to be initially integrated into the Ripple protocol and then you separated exactly. it? Exactly. So when you have something like a consensus network, right, um, it's, it's very intuitive or it's very, uh, most people think about it, okay, let's add programmability to this consensus network and just treat it like a big computer, right? Yeah. Um, and one of the things that, that you run into is that a consensus network, it's very important that everything it does is what in computer science is called deterministic. Um, so you can't have anything where you have this peer-to-peer -peer network and then one node executes a transaction and another yeah. node executes the same transaction but it gets a different result. Like maybe it only paid like $3 instead of $6 and now suddenly you have two different results and your network diverges, so that's very bad. Yes. Um, however, like all of the consensus networks already deal with uncertainty to some extent where it's like if someone transmits a transaction first um, and it gets in, and then someone submits a, uh, a different conflicting transaction, transition, uh, transaction like the double spend issue, um, yes. networks have a solution for that. That's like, in fact, that's the whole point of the consensus network in the first place. And so um, what we started doing pretty early on is we started to think of it as a two-stage process, right? So rather than having um, just this one scripting language that's built into the, the, the ledger, um, we had um, a, a deterministic portion, which was sort of executed on all the nodes, um, uh, you know, as a transaction was being applied, and then we had a non-deterministic portion, which was able to, like, it would have been able to do things like query outside servers and like crazy stuff like that, where like you don't know if you're going to get the same answer every time, um, but those are really important things that like, you might want to check you know, make a smart contract that depends on the weather. And so you need to query, query a weather API or something like that. Just pra pragmatic things that the way we write code, you, we need to do them all the time. And so uh -huh. we kind of try to split up in these two categories. And the okay. issue the issue that we ran into with that is um, now you're starting to make your system very complex, right? So you have your ledger. A consensus ledger is already a very, very complex piece of technology, very hard to build. And I was actually having a conversation with uh, the product manager for Google Spanner, which is a, um, it's sort of a global, um, it's sort of a global database that Google runs internally that, that sort of uh -huh. manages all of the different services. And they think of that as a monumentally complex project. And I told them that we're basically trying to do the same thing except it's different people running it, and so they can't trust each other. So it becomes like one order of magnitude more complex. <laughs> it's like you guys are insane. Uh, you just, uh -huh. It's just a crazy problem to work on. 
And so adding more stuff to that problem, um, like adding a programming environment, adding two programming environments, you just get into a point where it's just no longer. Um, okay. And so we kind of went back uh, to the drawing board, and we kind of okay, how do we how do we kind of break these apart? And we already had the split between the deterministic and the non-deterministic execution side, and so it's it started to look more like a traditional three-tier architecture. So the way that most applications are written today is you have some sort of front end, um, like um, you know your, your, your desktop app, your mobile app, your browser app, whatever. Um, then you have some sort of business logic layer, which could be PHP, Java, you know, like your server backend thing. Um, uh, Java Enterprise Edition, who knows what it is, right? Yes. Um, and that's where most of your application logic, like who can do what and like what happens when you do a certain thing on the client, etc., um, is implemented. And then you have a database. And databases are, like, I would say fairly slow moving, big, uh, complex pieces of software. Um, and they, they pr pr provide these very specific guarantees around, like, uh, atomicity, consistency, durability. Um, and so that's that's a stack that's worked really well for most of software development. It's what most engineers are used to. And so yeah. we're starting to look at that stack and say, like, how does that apply to decentralization and how does that apply to cryptocurrencies? Mm -hmm. And in cryptocurrencies, you definitely have clients. Like, that's no, no question about that. Um, and you definitely have databases. Like, Bitcoin is basically a big database. Ripple is basically a big database. Um, and so suddenly it seems really silly to try and build programmability into the database. It's like trying to write all your software in SQL, right? It's like yes. it's it's not something that you normally do, but rather you would have some sort of middleware layer. But there's no such thing for cryptocurrencies. And we're like, that's what we want to build. That's that's a that's a missing link, right? Um, building a business logic layer like the Node.js for decentralized applications, right? Uh -huh. Some some place where it can query anything, it can interact with any system, it can be decentralized itself, and then it uses consensus ledgers in order to coordinate its actions. And uh, we can go into more of the details later. The, what, what, I, what I see is that, for example, uh, Bitcoin, in terms of layers, is two layers because it's the blockchain, which is, would be the, the database, and then the client that we install in our computers, which is Bitcoin Core, and, and from there we see our balance and send and receive, etc. <laughs> You could have a third layer in a service like Coinbase, for example, that they get the, the core and then they show it to you, to the user, through through the web. Um, so to, to address your point, like I think there's a lot of um, middleware for Bitcoin. It's just all centralized middleware, and like even if if people are building individual applications that are decentralized sort of middleware, there's no general framework, no tool that allows you to build um, these kind of middleware layers um, very efficiently, very quickly, like an Ethereum contract, where you just you write up the code, you push send, and it just goes out into some sort of cloud and runs as distributed middleware. That's kind of the, the vision for code. And, and what, what I, I, I think we have a, a little bit of interference, and also I think there's a meeting here. <laughs> yeah, um, give me one second. Yeah, sorry about that. It's an open, open floor uh, office, so it kind of comes with the territory. <laughs> and and, and um, what I see also, Bitcoin it has these two layers. It could have a third one if someone wants to provide the service using Bitcoin Core, like you say, as, as a middleware, and then uh, showing showing the services to the client in, in the front end on a browser. Um, and But it has a little memory, and the scripting language seems to be limited also for full smart contracts. Yeah, so, the case? Um, so no, the, the, the Codeus programming language is not limited at all. It neither has um, determinism limitations nor does it have any kind of limitations in terms of not being Turing complete. So it's fully no, Turing complete. I, I, I meant, I, I meant, bit, I meant bit, uh, Bitcoin. Bitcoin right, has so, those limitations, right. I mean. Correct. So, yeah, so Bitcoin has to be very limited. And that, again, that comes from being built into a database, right? Like, if you have a language that's built into a yeah. database, that comes with a lot of restrictions. And so with Codius, what we're trying to do is we're trying to have um, a system where you need like Cody's contracts are ideally don't have much state, they don't have much memory themselves. Um, they use consensus ledgers like Ripple, Bitcoin, Ethereum, etc., to store their data, to keep their state, and to coordinate with each other. 
Um, but then they themselves um, implement the complex logic. They potentially implement um, things where performance matters a lot, like complex cryptographic operations, etc. Um, and so it kind of provides a place to put your logic, um, to your, your, your business logic. OK. Uh, so, so Codius is all the smartness is separated from, say, Bitcoin or, or, or Ripple. And uh, it's it's in a different network. So can can you explain how how would Codius be designed? How is the design of the network and the software? Mm -hmm. um, so the first thing about Codius is it's not a network, at least um, ah. not in a traditional sense. So okay. there's no there's no sense in which um, the nodes inherently talk to each other. It's more like um, you need to find out what the nodes are. Um, then choose them by some metric that you care about. Um, and then once you've chosen nodes to execute your contract, you need to upload your contract and run it. Um, and kind of, it's kind of an interesting thing about how that contrasts to um, how uh, blockchains work, where in a blockchain, it's kind of all bundled together, right? So um, if you adopt a certain blockchain, let's say Bitcoin, right, then that comes with uh, proof of work as the mechanism for determining who you trust to figure out yes. the ordering of transactions, right? Like if there's there's some people who are doing mining and they ultimately yes. decide what ordering of transactions is going to be the canonical order. Yes. Um, and so there's also built in how many there are. Like there's a certain amount of miners, there's a certain amount of miners that form a majority. Those are not things that you control, right? Um, and so what we're trying to do with Cody is, is like we're trying to give you since we don't need to restrict those things, since Codis itself doesn't need to come to a consensus globally, um, we can give you choice on those metrics. So you can have, um, you can say, I prefer proof of work or I can prefer proof of stake. And you can say, uh -huh. I need three nodes for my application or 3,000. And since decentralization is, is fundamentally a trade-off, it's like if I want to run something on 10,000 nodes, I'm going to pay 10,000 times the fee. So it really depends on what my interaction is or my transaction is based on whether that makes sense for me or not. And so we allow you to kind of design your um, application around your use case and trying to give you a lot of flexibility. Is, is, is Codius an open source project? Yeah, absolutely. Every, every line is open source. It's on github.com slash Codius, and the website is codius.org. I see, I see that, for example, as an entrepreneur, someone could say, I, I have the Ripple network here, B the Bitcoin network here, some other network here. They have assets there. Uh, I, w I would like to be uh, uh, or start a, a code just node business, no? So mm -hmm. I, I get a set of computers, a data center, or whatever I want to to have to, whatever, I want to configure it, and I install Codius and I become a host. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, what I see, what I read of the Codius uh, white paper and, and your website is that Co Codius has like um, two roles. One, one thing is to grab information and be aware of what's happening in the world. Mm -hmm. And the other one is to actually host the contracts, no? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Those are, so, so I could uh, provide a service where, where developers and entrepreneurs and people, users, can, can store the contracts in my host and from my host, the accounts on Ripple and Bitcoin and others would be operated by the contracts? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, the way I would frame Codius in terms of like who is it for, like who is the target audience, is it's mm -hmm. clearly for developers, right? It's like for the person, uh, for, the, for the developer or entrepreneur who, who has a goal of building a decentralized application, and as someone who's worked in that space for years now, like three or four years now, um, I know how hard it is to to actually decentralize something. You kind of you start out, you know, with your centralized application. You kind of figure out how it works, what it does. Now you need to go out, and need to convince, you know, some trustworthy or worthy party to, for parties to run it, or you need to translate it into some uh, blockchain scripting language. That process is very hard, and it's actually very few people who've done that successfully so far. And so um, what we're trying to do is we're trying to really capture the essence of decentralization, where it's like, I don't have control over what the code is that runs. Like, that's ultimately what it comes down to. It's like, mm -hmm. I want to be able to say, you don't have to trust me that this contract does what it says, but you know, there's this group of people. It could be a very large group. And it's very unlikely that they'll all come together just to to screw you or just to you know to you know, do something malicious, right? Okay. So so uh, provi as, as a provider of a Codio service, I would be a host 
but uh, the idea is for me not to be aware of who's using it or what are the contracts that I'm hosting. So we look at basically two user groups, right? One is the, the Codius host, which is basically like a hosting company um, which wants to provide a little bit of a value-add service, right? So they, they might already offer you to upload software, but what you currently can't do is um, prove what software you've uploaded and that you haven't tampered with it after the fact, right? So like if I rent a server with Amazon, um, and let's say it's supposed to handle some escrow for our transaction, then I still have SSH access. I can at any time sort of log in and change the rules and, and, and have it do something different, um, at least without some really advanced trickery. Um, and so what we're trying to do is we're trying to create a standard around um, I upload my program, and then the host says, this is what they uploaded. We warrant that. We attest to that. Um, mm -hmm. And so if you have a lot of hosts attesting to um, what code is running, then eventually it becomes pretty credible. It eventually becomes trustworthy enough. Um, and so that is one group. It's the host, right? And that's a business, right? It's, it's, it's probably closest to like a Bitcoin miner or Ethereum miner where um, you're basically earning money providing a service of trust. Um, mm -hmm. And then on the other hand, you have the uploader, the developer of entrepreneur. Yes. Um, and what they're looking for is they're looking to buy trust or defer trust. Whereas like, okay, they might just be a, someone who's not very well known. They're just, you know, they need these larger brands or they need this distributed trust in order to, for people to be comfortable interacting with their program, right? So they just opened up a website for escrow and they're, they're just some guy from who knows where. Um, it's hard to get people to put money into that. And so um, for them, what they're buying is not just the hosting, which is already cool. Great. You, you need to buy hosting anyway. Hosting um, and execution. Hosting and execution. Um, mm -hmm. But they're also buying the trust of like people being able to trust this other brand and being able to review the code themselves and, and yes. what they what they want. Mm -hmm. Very oh. good. Um, you, you mentioned uh, uh, something. Uh, it's not a network, Codius. But if there's a hundred Codius uh, hosts, I, I read on the on the um, website that it works a little bit like a peer-to-peer -peer network because there is like a backing up of the contracts, and if somebody closes down, the contracts are going to still live in the network and be executed and things like that. So, how is that? Is, is it like a peer-to-peer backend, peer-to-peer network for hosting? Mm -hmm. So, I mean. There's obviously like what do we have right now, and then what is what? Where would we ultimately like to end up? And um, yes. I think right now we're starting with very humble beginnings. We're trying to get a few reliable Codius hosts um, online. Um, mm -hmm. I think one of the things is like because Codius hosting is basically like VM hosting. Um, when we first started, we thought of it a lot more like um, something that uh, anyone can do, or, or you know, it's just it's it's like maybe. Uh, big brands would do it, like big banks or big, uh, you know, like, I don't know, accounting firms or like whoever is like the most yes. trusted brands out there. Um, but as we went along, it seemed like there's actually a lot more that you know trusting than just a brand. You're also trusting how good they are at keeping their systems secure and how good they are at keeping their systems online. And those are yes. things that are just in the in the domain of hosting companies. So the way we think about it now is like I think the best Codius host would just be um, good hosting companies, right? generally good hosting companies, and then um, the brand is kind of an added bonus. So that's where we're at. We're trying to find the, the right hosts um, just to bootstrap the system. And in our minds, like even if we just have a small group of hosts, for a lot of use cases, it will already be useful. Like One thing that um, was surprising to me, and uh, one use case I hadn't really thought of myself, was that a lot of people, a lot of engineers or developers just want to build something for their own use. And right now they can't really do something like, oh, I want to build a contract where um, if I work out every day, then um, I get my money back. And if I don't work out every day, then it goes to some charity, something that I don't like. Yes. like you know, these kind of like self-blackmail like fund contracts. And it's yes. kind of hard to do those um, unless you have a place to put code that you don't control yourself afterwards, right? Mm -hmm. um, so those are like some of the first initial things. And they're kind of like fun and like, not, not that mission critical, um, but I think from there you can kind of grow the network, and when you do get to 100 hosting companies, 200 hosting companies, then we can start to think about, okay, we need better ways of selecting hosts automatically, selecting larger groups of hosts, etc. cetera, um, and I think that's where a lot of this like peer-to-peer -peer ideas come in, um, but I think it, it, it's, it's an ecosystem that wants to be nurtured, uh, and it has to grow to that point first before. Very, very good. 
my, my, my last question is, uh, in the case of Bitcoin, like we said before, like, like, I, like I told you, I read, for example, uh, Nick Zabo wrote an article where he mentioned that Bitcoin scripting language is very limited and uh, the memory is very limited there. Um, but then we have uh, examples like uh, Ethereum, that, they, that it's a blockchain where you can store contracts, but it's a specific language. Even They, they even created a language for that. Uh, it's called Solidity. In the case of Codius, it supports many languages. Um, yeah, so again, like coming from the Bitcoin experience and kind of the background of that is, is um, you know, Mike Hearn and I, we founded the, the Swiss Meetup, and one of the things we would end up talking about a lot is, is kind of smart contracts and what you, what you can do with Bitcoin scripts. And my view on that is not so much that the scripting language is limited so you can't do things, um, mm -hmm. Almost every use case that we, we that we looked at, there was some crazy way of like mapping it onto that scripting language. So it's not the issue that it's not possible; it's just not easy. Um, okay. And that means a lot. Not a lot of developers can do it, and that ultimately means that not a lot of it happens, right? Um, okay. And I think Ethereum is like a big, big step in the right direction because it's much closer to how people are used to writing software. Um, mm -hmm. The only concern I, I would have with that is um, it's still deterministic. Right, so um, you still can't make an HTTP call directly out of an Ethereum contract. So it still requires this other piece, this this middleware layer to connect to. And I think in that sense, like Ethereum and Codius are really complementary because Codius doesn't really work if you don't have some sort of ledger or data store or blockchain that you can store your data in. And Ethereum doesn't really work if you don't have something to talk to the outside world. So I, I yes. really see those systems as very complementary. And we've had really good interactions with the Ethereum team on like potentially working together and, and kind of exploring that that interaction better. But like I said before, on, on, on Ethereum, if you want to write a contract, uh, it has to be uh, in, in that language, Solidity. Mm -hmm. In the case of Codius, it's multiple languages that you support? Yeah, so um, right now we have a prototype that supports JavaScript. Um, and I'm just working on a branch on my um, private repository right now. Um, I think it's public, so you can see it, but it's like it's on my own repository right now, um, which would switch to Docker containers. And Docker is just a, a general Linux container right now. Um, so yeah, you can write programs in any language. You can use existing software. If you want, you can run MySQL inside of a Codius contract or Bitcoin or Ripple or you know any kind of crazy thing you can come up with. And at that point, it really becomes like the absolute minimum metaphor for deferring trust. We call this uh, tested hosting. It's kind of like, hey, you know, I'm giving you this thing to run. You can say what you're running, but other than that, it's the same as hosting. It has always been. Very good. Bueno, Stefan, thank you very much for your time and, and for the explanation. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.